Behind home plate, we bringing it to him all day. Bringing it to you always. always. You know what's up? Welcome to Birdland. Orange or black, we rebuild the pack. No matter where we at, you know we coming back. Section 336, we on this, so tune in. Tune in. You know what's up? Welcome to Birdland. Yeah, yeah. Welcome to Birdland. You know what's up? What's up? Welcome to Birdland. Birdland. Now, here come the boys from Section 336. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Baltimore sports fans of all ages, welcome to Section 336 Next Generation Baltimore Sports Talk. I am your endearingly student host, Matt Soroka. As always, I'm joined by the button lover, Josh Soroka. Hey, Matt. I just got an email saying fantasy football is back. Yeah, I saw that email. Yeah, it, it, I guess it kicked off our fantasy football league. Is it already football season? Well, it's getting about that time. I mean, it's all-star break. I guess we got to look at our rules. Uh, yeah, this is the time that we should reevaluate the rules and, and set up drafts and all that type of stuff, I guess. Yep. It's also the time where, for years, we just prayed for the Orioles for us to care up to this point. Yeah, yeah. We wanted them to get competitive up until, I don't know, training camp. First game of the season seems like a, a bit much to ask. Um, but just to at least we start talking about Ravens football. Yeah. Uh, and, and this year, it didn't really happen. <laughs> no, we've got other reasons to talk about the Orioles. And, I mean, we've had been able to – I mean, we're still going to talk Orioles tonight. There's still things to talk about. Well, um, I hope so. It's an Orioles podcast. Right. But I guess we should start with the fact that we're recording in the same room for the first time in a long time. Yeah. Since I don't know when. So, yeah. So, if audio's different, I think we mentioned on previous episodes that we'd be down at the beach this week. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, it's, it's, it's good. And we got to watch some of the game together today. Uh, and hang out. So yeah, it, it's all good. And yeah, it's it's. I prefer talking in person than Zoom. This is it's, like old times. Would this also be now officially like Bert's cut out of the podcast because we invited him to in join us house. tonight and in the house? He's literally probably twenty feet away, <laughs> wherever and, it is. And he declined. Yeah, uh, and he declined. Yeah. So, but, yeah, but that's all right. The best part about running into people at the stadium this year was. When people didn't know who Zany Burt Rody was. Yeah, that always makes me laugh. So that was fun. my day. You can tell. You can age. Uh, the age, how long you've listened to the podcast as far as if you're pre-Burt right. or post-Burt. Yeah, right. You can also tell by how many of them were in high school or middle school and now they're like in college or in the Army. Yeah, it's true. It's, it's, it's like teaching, right? When I teach all my high schoolers, then all of a sudden you look on Facebook and they're getting married or getting jobs. You're like, what happened? Right. I taught them. I felt like a last year and. I had, a, old. Uh, yeah. I had a softball game before coming, and I had a new umpire that I've never had before. And I go up to bat. And first That's time. weird that you guys have umpires, but okay, go ahead. Oh, yeah, we, we have umpires. And weird to me. It was a little weird because I we normally have the same umpires. This was a new guy I've never met before. So as a pitcher, I don't like that because I know the strike zone of all the other guys. But uh, Wait, anyway. you're hitting a mat? Yeah, it's mat, but height. Height, okay. height gives a lot. Okay. And we got some blind umps that'll give me a little bit on each side of the mat. Uh, but anyway, his comment when I went up to the plate for my first bat was the, about the Oriole tattoo. So I started okay. talking to him about the Orioles. Sure. And he was like, yeah, I saw the Orioles old guy. So he's like, yeah, I can't remember that amazing Orioles team that won in the uh, early 80s. Yeah. And I just looked at him like, yeah, it must be nice. I said, I'm still waiting to see one in my lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. 1983. It's Yeah. We, we haven't seen it, but... Um, we're getting close, right? It's almost 2023 now. It's just a couple years away. So we, it's exciting times. Yeah, and we, I don't knock on every piece of wood in this house, but I don't think things can get much worse. I think we've hit the bottom of the rebuild. Yeah, that. I mean, that may be true. I mean, uh, I mean, it just, it just so happens to be while we're doing this podcast on a Monday night, we just saw the Orioles beat Tampa Bay. This is coming after winning a two out of three against the Royals. Right. So this now all of a sudden we've won three in a row. And so. You uh, know what three in a row is? A winning streak. That's a winning streak. That's a winning streak. And I don't want to get ahead of myself here, Josh, but if there was ever a time for the Royals to actually win some amount of ball games, this is the point in the schedule where we could win some ball games. This is the weakest part of the schedule for the whole year. Yeah. 
And so it's good to see us coming out of the all-star break, taking two or three against Kansas City, and now at least winning one against Tampa Bay. And you hope you can win one more of the next two games. You've got John Means starting tomorrow. So, you know, you, I don't – my expectations for John Means are not too high. We can get into it, but coming off injury. Yeah. Like, the question is, if John Means comes back tomorrow, who's out of the rotation? Eshelman, Aiken, <laughs> how do you make room for John Means? I don't know. Do it's hard to keep track. Do we even have five guys? We do. Right now, Eshelman and Aiken are currently still in the rotation. Yeah, it's going to be one of those guys. Um, Watkins, though. Uh, Watkins pitched again tonight, Monday night. Another good outing from him. He's shown it up that he's going to be staying in here for a while, right? Yeah, Spencer Watkins is one of the coolest stories this year. Here's a 28-year-old who has been in the minors since 2014. He racked up um, 123 games, 102 games started in the minors, pitched over 600 innings in the minors before he ever got a chance um, to, to, to get to the majors. Just a cool story, a guy who's thinking about quitting and coaching. Um, but can you imagine, we talk a lot about how minor leaguers kind of get no respect <laughs> Via, right. like, just respect and, like, paycheck, like, mon- 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 monetary respect. And so for seven years, to be getting by, making no money, kind of the grind of the minor leagues, having to work in the offseason, most likely. He was a 30th round pick. Um, I think he had a $1,000 signing bonus. There was a good article by a friend of the show, Rich Dubroff, um, on BaltimoreBaseball.com. Um, it, with with Spencer Watkins talking about how he had a thousand dollars, and he thought he was so pumped because like you're giving me a thousand dollars to go play baseball, like get right. out of here, let's go. And Sounds that was for 2014, yeah. But after you're doing this for seven years, making no money, sticking with it every year, I mean, at some point you're like, um, you gotta be thinking about throwing the towel. But it's just a great story. This is another successful start. Um, I think he's thrown what up to I think around 17 innings um, at this point in his career or as a major leaguer uh, this year. Um, and w- what's the number here? Let's see. Yeah, he's thrown. Um, I don't have, I don't know what the stats are. If it's, it's being caught up. But he's got a year under two at this point, And he's definitely solidified himself, at least for the, you know, going forward as, as starting so, every fifth day. I mean, I mean, if you have Hunter Harvey still starting, I know Hunter Harvey just had a great game against the Royals. Right. Where he gave him no runs. You mean Matt Harvey. Um, yeah, I would say Hunter Harvey. Matt Harvey. And if you have Jorge Lopez still starting, certainly, <laughs> like, a guy who's actually pitching well, you're going to have him starting every fifth day. Of course. So Spencer Watkins is in no danger um, of losing a spot in the rotation. And, and yeah, I think it's going to be fun. It's going to be interesting to see, right? Because teams haven't seen him before. So as he, there's more more tape on him, um, if if teams adjust and how he's able to respond to to those adjustments, uh, but Spencer Watkins tonight was just was just absolutely brilliant. So it's exciting, right? Because I mean, just recently Matt Harvey pitching well, Spencer Watkins. I mean, yeah. the story of this the first half of the Orioles is their starting pitching, and that's for the second half. Yeah, yeah. Well, if but you want to look at the first half record, it is what it is. Most 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 of the reason it is what it is because of the starting pitching. Right. So it's really encouraging to see. Both Matt Harvey and Spencer Watkins. And the Orioles are hitting the ball well in these games, too. Um, which makes me wonder. All right, so the story right now, we got past the All-Star game. We got past the Home Run Derby. We got past the draft. Uh, this week we signed our top players from the draft. Yep. So now the story for Michael Elias is the trade deadline. Yeah. We're like two weeks out. Yeah. If that. Uh, does the Orioles playing well help or hurt yeah. his case? Less or, than two weeks. Or does it not even matter? Well, it always helps. I, th- I think if you're the Orioles playing well, helps you make trade deadline moves. For example, if you really wanted to move Mancini, I don't know if you do or not, but if you wanted to, today went two for four with a walk. That's pretty right. good. If you want to trade um, Cole Salser, he threw an, a scoreless inning. If you want to trade Paul Fry, he threw a scoreless inning. Um, and so I think at this point, like, you're not going to, oh, you're going on a, a five-game winning streak. Let's reconsider being sellers at the trade deadline. No. Like, that's not happening. Right, right. Yeah, I don't mean, don't mean transition into that. Do you think we'll be buyers if we sweep Tampa Bay? <laughs> no. Uh, do you think um, one more great start from Watkins and we're trading him? What can you get from this kid? No, I saw someone tweet, though, about Matt Harvey. Like, can you get something to take Matt Harvey 
Because he um, pitched so well. I mean, it's interesting, right? Because he pitched well the first, you know, handful of starts, the first month of the season. Yeah, then a bad two months. Then bad two months. And now, I don't know what happens. Like, what happened if Matt Harvey goes well, out again with his track record, knowing at some point in his career he was a great pitcher? What if he has another good start? I, th- I mean, I don't know how many times he's going to – maybe one, again, maybe two more starts before the trade deadline. And um, that's where you'd have to do a little more work and see who he faced and be like, all right, well – is he going to bode better in the National League? Is he going to go bode better not facing the AL East? Um, look at his splits and all that. Because two weeks ago, he had a good outing. And then he had a bad outing. And then he had a good again. Yeah, but his ERA is still over seven. It's hard to imagine Yeah, it's not any a, playoff contending team trading for starting pitching that has an ERA of seven. No, he's going to have to be like Grayson Rodriguez and get 12 strikeouts to really drop that ERA. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't envision him being traded. I mean, Spencer Watkins certainly isn't getting traded. Um, I think you got to look at the bullpen arms, right? If you want to trade anybody, it's gonna, I think it's going to be those bullpen arms. Cole Saucer, Paul Fry are two examples of guys who pitched today. They, they could be on the move because everyone looks for bullpen help. Well, also, I'd say Wells. Tyler Wells, we've been showing off in this closer role recently. Yeah. So maybe you, trying to show him off using him late in games. Yeah, it's interesting, right, because he has – I mean, like no service time so far. He's he's a he's a younger kid, um, and so you know that 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 would be not to the extent of like a Cedric Mullins, but that would certainly be saying we don't think we're competing anytime soon. So even a guy yeah. who who want to be a free agent for another five years, we'd be willing to part with them. So I'd be All I right. would really be really surprised if they do something with that's him. That's true. That makes sense. Um, but certainly Salser and Fry and and then know, yeah, Mullins, Mancini, Santander. Right, like Those it's, are your chips. Right, and it was actually today is a good example of the players you want to play well played well. Like Hayes played well, Mancini played well, Matt Castle had a hit, Santander, um, you know, he, he walked, had a run scored, had an RBI. Um, and so those guys played well. As far as trading goes, it doesn't really matter what Pat Vileka does or McKenna or uh, Gutierrez. I'm so um, tired of Vileka in this lineup. Yeah, so it's... But the guys you want to play well played well. Now I, I don't I don't think there's enough time for Santander to Santander to pr- prove his numbers enough to be traded. Um, and so I think Trey Mancini is is the big question mark going in. And if he gets hot, like if he has he played well today, if he has a, a hot you know week of baseball. I remember when Jonathan Scope was traded. He was like a freaking fire at the end of July. Yeah, well, that's part of the reason we got such a big return for Jonathan Scope. So I think that's what's going to, need to happen with Trey Mancini. Well, so that's, that's something to watch. Same story is going on with Scope in uh, Detroit now. Oh, is he on a hot streak? Yeah, yeah, he's doing well enough that they they're looking to trade him. Yeah, he's he's the best in July, man. You, you want Jonathan Scope in July? They're having the same conversation we had a few years ago. Do you trade him or do you sign him? Yeah, long term. So, and I think he he might be first base for them now. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I mean, Jonathan Scope seems to be like a everybody wants him in a one-year deal, but no one likes him enough to give him a multi-year deal. Right. Situation. Yeah. So, we'll yeah. see. I mean, that's going to be the, that's the storyline. And the good thing for the Orioles going into this two-week storyline is they got some weak opponents coming up. Yeah. That's after, a- after a really tough schedule to this point, uh, things seem to settle down a little bit with the Royals, the Rays. And Rays are are good. Rays are are the Rays still in first place? Uh, no, I think the I think the Red Sox are in first place, but they're they're right there with them. So. Yeah, and and I mean after that we have the the the, the Nats, which have been struggling a, a, a bit, and then after that we have Miami, which is not a great team, and then we have Detroit, which is not a great team, and so yeah, this the rest of the month after Tampa Bay are against teams with losing records, and so this is a chance to kind of showcase your guys. Um, I don't know. I could see us, you know, I could see I could see a couple things happening. I could see Orioles trading three guys. I could see Salsa, Fry, Mancini all going. Or I could see a very likely possibility where no one's traded, which would be kind of weird. And that's, yeah, I keep thinking about that whole scenario of no one trading. And I, I just can't see Michael Elias, as far as what we know of Michael Elias, just sitting there and not doing anything, yeah. not making a move. Yeah, but, but all the guys we're talking about, um, it's not like any of them are walking away at the end of the season. Right. Right. Uh, Mancini's back for one more year. Uh, Fry would be back. Saucer would be back. So no one you, – you don't have a gun to your head here, right, if you're right. Mike Elias. And you can but, just wait. Right. And you're also down to 
as Mike Elias, he's down to his final guys. These are his guys. These are his final guys to trade. Yeah. So it's he's either trading him this trade deadline, trading him this off season, or not trading him at all. Yeah. Like if he trades, if he trades these three guys during this trade deadline or five guys or whatever, then he has no chips for the off season. Right. It's true. And we were doing. I was doing a little prep work earlier this week because we're going to do an episode on kind of looking back at Dan Duquette's traits. Because because now's a good time because this is the three year anniversary, right? Of the Manny Machado being traded, yeah. Of Kevin Gossman be, be, being traded, of you know Jonathan Scope being traded, all these guys, Zach Britton being traded, all these guys. Um, and Dan Duquette, like, you only get one shot at this. To you have good players, Zach Britton, across the board, everyone agree, a really good pitcher. Um, Manny Machado, a great player. Yep. Kevin Gossman, a good pitcher. And so you only have one shot at this. And, and, and Dan Duquette did it, right? Like Dan Duquette made, made all these trades. And we'll kind of reflect on kind of the return of these trades three years later in, in a later episode. But when Mike Elias got here, he didn't have any big tokens, right? Like he managed to trade guys like Jonathan VR, like Tommy Malone, Richard Blyer. But like, like, like but this is small potatoes, right? All, all, the, all the big names were gone. And I think Trey Mancini is the biggest – guy Michael Elias has had as far as making a trade. Like, like uh, maybe Miguel Castro, Michael Givens. I think everyone agrees we'll see how those trades work out, but we got really good returns at the time. It feels like Michael Elias has always gotten really good returns for the trades he's made. But it's always like, well, <laughs> if you're trading Miguel Castro, you really don't care that much who you get back in return. Whatever, right, anybody's right. fine. I think Michael Givens was a nice arm. And so you kind of cared who got back. But, like, it's, he's a reliever. Yeah. Right? It was not Manny Machado. It was not um, any of these big guys. And so Trey Mancini is a big guy. So Trey Mancini, if you're going to make the deal with Trey Mancini, and I, I disagree with people who say the Orioles fan base will turn on Mike Elias if they, if they trade Trey now, Mancini. Those yahoos have already turned on Mike those, Elias. Those are the ones. That, yeah, exactly. The guys who are going to turn on Mancini are the same people who are already turning on Elias because he didn't draft uh, a rocker. But but if you if Mike Elias trades Trey Mancini for two seventeen year olds that no one's ever heard of, that's an issue. That's going to be a problem. Yeah, that's a problem. And it wouldn't be a problem with anybody else. Like you can do that with uh, Paul Fry or yep. or anybody else really. But but you can't do that with Mancini, with Trey Mancini. or Cedric Mullins. Right, right. Or, or Cedric, the, Mullins. Cedric, two... Cedric Mullins has much more trade value yes. than Trey Mancini. Yeah, that's your biggest chip. But either of those guys, you need to get. Top 10 guy, that's a year or two away. Yeah, the top 10 guy in your farm system. Yep. I mean, it's, trades are weird, right, how they work out because um, – but, yeah, but you want to have guys who can be and as impact our, guys. Right, and as our farm system keeps getting better, it means those top 10, it's, it's a better player you're getting into that. Yep. What you, to get a top 10 in the Orioles farm system used to be really easy. You just trade with anyone. Yep, yep. No, no, it's true. Um, and, th- yeah, and that's a good thing about the Orioles farm system. It's, it's getting better and better. And this is like your Michael Elias. You, you only have a couple ways to improve your – there's three ways to improve your prospects, to improve your – to acquire talent. And we still – Michael Elias still in the acquire talent stage. The draft, um, international signings, and trades. Yep. Um, and we see him doing the draft. We see him doing international signings. And, and we'll see if he can do anything with the trade in these next two weeks. And we'll see how these trade candidates, because there's not very many of them, uh, perform the next two two weeks. All right, Actually, and then watch. All right, so we're recording uh, later this week. We're going to record that uh, trade deadline, trade reviews. Yep. Looking back at these trades and kind of comparison, which would be, I would love it. We don't have the uh, contacts. I would love for someone to sit down with Dan Duquette now and talk about these moves years later. Yeah. Well, it's really hard, right? Because because at the time. You can assess the trade. I mean, right. using Diaz, and we'll get into this, but using Diaz was a top 100 prospect when we traded for him. He moved. I Yeah, he was in our top 10 when we yeah. traded for him. Oh, sure. Sure. He probably, I would go back and look at it, but he was in our top five um, as far as prospect goes. So it's one thing to, like, feel like you got the return and value with the prospects. It's another thing to then three three years later see how that 21-year-old, 21-year-old you got is now playing at the age of 24. Yeah, uh, and so it's it's really hard, right? It's really hard because all that is also directly to tied to how you develop these players too. 
which everyone kind of tends to agree that Mike Elias and his regime does a better job developing talent, especially pitchers, but developing talent than the previous regime has done. So part of that is on kind of who you yeah sure you know who you acquire and then how you develop that talent that you acquire. No, it definitely seems like the coaching in the farm systems better right now. And yeah. again, we we can lean on the examples of Project Bowie and Cedric Mullins last season. Yeah. And stuff as as we are having good coaching outside of the major league level. Yeah, I mean people are praising the Michael Elias trades from last year, especially like guys like the, the Michael Givens return. Yep. But but we don't know, right? Cuz right. none of those players have made any impact on the professional baseball team on 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 the major league. I'm sorry, on the major league Oriole team. Yeah. Um, even Jemai Jones, who seems really close, right? Who we got from <laughs> Scott, um, he he's now has has yet to make any impact. No. So it feels like a good trade, but he has yet to make any impact. He's made an on the impact. Major team, so he's we have made an impact see. on the fan base. Made an impact he, on the fan people base. People love. I'm sure he's helped Triple A Norfolk's record. Uh, yeah. But but you have to kind of be patient. It's a tough thing about being a general manager is you make deals now that you don't know if they're going to work out till four or five years down the road. Um, and so just now we're finding out how the how the Dan Duquette trades are turning out. We're not going to know um, whether these Michael Elias trades have turned out for several years down the road either. So it's really tough to evaluate. Yeah. Just like the draft. It's really tough to evaluate the job that Michael Elias is doing. Jemiah Jones is batting two ninety nine with seven home runs and an OPS of 930. Yeah, that's that's better than any current Orioles player. <laughs> Outside of Mullins. His OPS might be higher than Mullins. I don't know what Mullins' OPS is right now. I bet it's not 930. Um, so that's incredible. So, 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 so props to props to my Jones, and I, I, I think it's just a matter of time. I, I I'm off the promote to my Jones bandwagon. It's gonna happen when it happens, right. and I'm good with it. It's gonna happen in September, you would assume, or or you save it for next year. I don't know. Uh, All right, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It could happen tomorrow, too. I don't know. I mean, it's funny when you got guys like Pat Valeka batting, like, 180. Yeah, that, yeah. I think that's why Oriole fans are upset. That's what the people are irritated with. Is, yeah, if he was an outfielder, we'd be like, oh, okay, whatever. Right. You got you got, um, you got got guys out there. If he was a first baseman, like, all right, whatever. You but got it, guys out there. But there's just so obviously a position of need. Right. And he's playing so well. It, it just seems weird well, that he's not here. And what it does is it adds on to the people who are stupid and are upset that Adley Rushman's not in the majors right now well, when we have bad bad catchers. Well, and the news this week, Josh, I don't know if you saw this, but we took Adley Rushman number one. Yeah. The Kansas City Royals, who we just played, took Bobby Witt Jr. number two. Yeah. As a high schooler. So tell me why, Josh. Bobby Witt Jr. as a high schooler and Rutschman was a college player – Bobby Wood Jr. was just promoted uh-huh. to Triple A, and yeah. we still have our guy, college player, at Double A. Oh, because it's not because I think he's going to jump from Double to, to Majors. I don't think we're going to see much of Rushman at Triple A, and I think because he's a catcher, it's more about keeping him with uh, Grayson Rodriguez and DL Hall. Yeah. So that would be my logic and reason. Yeah, I mean, people argue. I don't know how true it is anymore because things change so much, but. It used to be it's, some years. Double, double A, a big job. has all the high prospects, right? And Triple A is more veteran guys. I think that's becoming less and less true. But 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 still, the, I mean, it's not like Double A. You're you're not seeing top prospects in Double A. Like right. a lot of studs are in Double A, um, and, and so he's played. He's facing good competition, right? And you look at the at the Norfolk Tide. And it seems like if the people at AAA are placeholders, like it's like an injured. Uh, for anyone that gets injured in the majors, you yank them out of AAA. You bring yeah. them up. So we have veterans and guys there. Uh, Adley Rushman's clearly better than a lot of the other guys in AAA. Yeah, I, I, I mean personally, you look at his walk rate, and you like you wish that you take him to AAA, where maybe pitchers can throw more strikes, and it wouldn't make sense to treat him at AAA. But there's also the the aspect of there's so many you know things to think about with this. Part of it is I think you want to keep him with Grayson Rodriguez, is who's your top pitching arm. Yep. Dia Hall, I know is injured right now, but he's still on that 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 roster. It's also I think I don't know if this matters at all, but the Bowie Bay Sox are closer to the Baltimore Orioles. Bowie's in Maryland, 
And so Oriole fans are more likely to see Adley Rutschman oh, you were in so Bowie close. than he is at Norfolk. You were so close to the other answer. It's not Oriole fans going and seeing him. Oh, it's, it's, it's Orioles staff. Elias doesn't Elias. want to make that long drive. Yeah, it's, it's Elias going over there. It's uh, extra if you need any extra coaching, training, developing, um, medical. It's all closer. If you want to bring Adley over to work out at Camden, you can. It's much more flexible. Yeah, but Adley, you think Adley will be a September call-up? No. Yeah. No, I think he will be. I think he will be a spring invite, and I think the fan base is going to freak uh, because... You thought there was a chance he could be the opening day starter this year. I think he has a chance for it next year. I th- we, all admit, we all know that if he was on the team, he'd be the best catcher on the team. Oh, yeah, I think he'd be one of the best catchers in baseball. Right, so there's no question that he is ready for the majors. Uh, the question is, how long do they hold him back because of other things? Yeah, and I, mean, I think I think the CBA is going to change this whole timeline of uh, players. And I mean, there's also a big question of if we have a season next year because of the CBA. Yep, and I heard some speculation with that might be a reason to not call him up or call up these prospects because if you call up Adley Rutschman, and let's say there's not a year, right? Right. Well, then are they going to count that as a year of his MLB service, service even though there wasn't a real season? Right. Um, is it a very real possibility? And so you hold him down just because you don't know what's going to happen yeah. next year. I, yeah, I don't know. I, and the CBA has so much effect on the Orioles' rebuild that it's a little irritating, the time end-wise, because of what you mentioned. Because 2020 was this half season already. Now we're going into the CBA next year. Where it d- yeah, it could be disastrous. It, if they don't have a normal season next year or if they delay it, any change to the schedule screws with the Orioles' rebuild. Yep. Though I did see an article, I don't forget who, who published it, but it was an article about kind of studying um, minor league performance, walk rate, you know, hit rate, all these strikeout percentage, all these, yeah. all these metrics comparing 2021 to 2019. Just to see, like what minor league, what minor league teams improved the most with the with, year without off without a year. Okay, and, and their kind of premise was, or their hypothesis was, the improved percentages of walk rate and strikeout rate and all these other data shows that the 2020 season was put to better use than maybe these other other squads. And the Orioles was kind of the headline of the article. The Orioles about how much the Orioles have improved in two years. Now, one could also argue we got more talent in those right. two years. Uh, we, we had the top draft picks. Right. Um, but also, like, um, just knowing what we know about Sigma Dell and Michael Elias and Matt Blood um, in charge of player development, they don't seem like the kind of guys who would just take the year off with their prospects. No. No, but that's, but that's not something that would happen next year. If next year's season got screwed up because of CBA negotiations – it would be a lot harder to do that You're stuff. You're not doing any of that stuff. Yes, it would be a lot harder. Because none of those players are working with you. Right. They're not allowed to. Yeah. Right. And I get the minor leaguers are aren't, not, are part, not of part of the union. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're also not going to be scabs, and they, be, they, want, they know they will eventually be part of the union. Right, right. Yeah, it becomes very complicated. Yep. Um, so, yeah, a, any delay in the season could be – Disastrous for the Orioles. I mean, it's disastrous for baseball in general, but specific right. Orioles. Yep. Yeah. Hey, can we talk about a couple coconuts? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about some coconuts. Um, now, now, coconuts are our best listeners. So, it's the coconuts you want to talk about? I know I some, some uh, Orioles players that I have emerged to me over the past week as true coconuts. As coconuts instead of like strawberries? Yeah, as guys who are just tough, you know, All right. All who right. face adversity, overcome adversity, and are just tough. All right. All right, let's talk about them. I mean, we mentioned Spencer Watkins. Right? Yeah. 28 years old, making his major league de- 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 debut. Coconut, right? Right. Being in the minors since 2014 and for seven years, making no money, just grinding, grinding, grinding coconut. Yeah, it reminds me of Caleb Joseph's story. Yep. Very similar. Um which also kind of just separate from the coconuts. We see Kevin Gossman this year. Sorry to bring his name up. 
<laughs> he's having a great year. He's leading, yeah, leading the Giants. He's having Josh the best year of his career. Correct. How old is he? Uh, uh twenty-eight. Thirty. He's thirty. All right. Thirty. Downside. Cedric Mullins having the best year of his career. How old is Cedric Mullins? Uh, thirty. I don't know how old he is. I think he's uh, like 28. Uh, what? You can't ask the question. <laughs> I know. But I'm, I was pretty much, I think he's 28. I could be, he could be 26. No, he, he might be 26 now that I'm thinking more of it. I got to look it up. Um, I'm going to go with 26. Let me look it up real quick. Yeah, he's 26. Um, but my point is, Mike Yastrzemski, we can make an argument, is I don't know how old he is, 27, 28, 29. Trey um, Mancini's 29. If you're trying to get someone closer to Kevin Gossman's age. Well, no, but my, the point I want to make, and it's not entirely true, Tremontini, is that some people have, like, they hit later in their career. Oh, like the John Means. John Means is another good 28 example. years old. Right. Had his best year, right, arguably this year before he got hurt. Right. But didn't start to pitch well until he was 26. Yep. I think sometimes, we see Spencer Watkins at 28, I think sometimes we're so quick to dismiss people. Like, people have called Yuzan Diaz a complete bust. He's 24, uh-huh. right? Like, right. we're so quick to just bury people. Yeah. I feel like this is starting to get a little personal with your job search. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm not in the grave yet, people. Right. All right? I'm still in my 30s. Don't bury me yet. I, I, no, I just think that we're so quick to – I mean, we're so obsessed with ages when it comes to, to performance right. in baseball. But, like, players just hit it in different – time periods and different ages yeah well sometimes the obsession is not because people hit young but we don't want to spend 10 years trying to develop you and if you don't hit by year five six it's all right let's move on to and invest our time and money into the next kid yeah it's true and but like guys could fall to, like that's and that's a scenario where Cedric Mullins could have been 25 and not working out and he could have fallen to the cracks yeah. that you know we're sure. moving on now but it also, and it speaks to the right coach in the right system, in the right ear. For Cedric Mullins, someone got in his head, which I believe was Buck Showalter at one point, and said, try not switch hitting. If no one ever got into his head about give up switch hitting, he probably wouldn't be where he is today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you got to wonder for a guy like Kevin Galsman and where we've seen other guys like Jake Arrieta leave and pitch well, when you get in the right system with the right coach that can point out the right thing to you with the right uh, video equipment, it helps. Maybe. Maybe. And that doesn't mean the Orioles don't have that, but different people are different. So a different person's going to click with you. Yeah, I mean, and I've been thinking a lot about also about Dean Kramer. He just gave up like seven runs yesterday right. in the like he was good last year for us, and this year he's just he's regressed so much that it's almost like he can't even get past the first inning in a in a Triple A A game, and you wonder like what happened with Dean Kramer. <laughs> right. And I just think like, um, and I don't think that's an issue where his stuff got worse. He's just he's he's not pitching. Um, you hear Jim Palmer talk about it all the time, like you just got to hit your spots. We saw Spencer Watkins not overpowering stuff, but he just hits his spots. Yeah. Um, and and sometimes it takes a player longer to realize how to pitch effectively or how to hit effectively or how to read the batter. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure there's a, a million things that go into it. Anyway, coconuts. So Spencer Watkins is one. The other guy this week came off the bereavement list. Um. Which, you know, I don't yeah, know how right. the bereavement list works. You know, Jorge Lopez. Well, he also had the all-star break, so timing worked out well. So yeah. he got an extended break. Right. But I thought that was just when someone passed away. It is, right. But you can use it for other reasons. Because he used it because his son was having a bone marrow transplant. So he used the bereavement list to spend time with his son. I don't know how that works. I don't know how that works. I don't know. Because um, you don't normally like get bereavement time at your job. Right. You get sick time or whatever. Right. But what do you call it when you have to go to the hospital for your child? You take a sick day? I would take a sick day, yeah. Right. But what does a personal baseball player do? You don't go to the IL for that. Right. Well, you know what it is? I think it's the same thing. What it is is it's to get around the IL so that you don't have to send the guy to the IL for 15 days, uh, but you need to give him some time off. I don't know. And I also don't know how it works because 
I guess it's, it's they got to get it on some type of list for you to bring up a replacement. Right. Because if you wanted to play with 25 guys instead of 26, you could just not list them for a few days. Well, and they ended up playing, actually, with 25 when he wasn't there instead of 26. Right. So they were probably trying to get around it a little bit. Yeah. But then, yeah, by putting them on the bereavement list allows you to. I don't know. What do they do? Well, I guess COVID list is a separate list. But what do they do, like, when a player gets the flu and can't play? Well, I think they just bench him. I guess so. You're right. They just bench him. They a day or two. And I know you get time if your wife gives birth. Though it's frowned upon if you give birth during the season. But you do get paternity leave. Well, just don't do it during the playoffs. I think you're okay. But but anyway, his, his Jorge Lopez's son, since he was born, like has had just so many medical issues and there, yeah. so many tests, it's kind of rare kind of diseases. Um, I don't I don't have the article in front of me, but uh, I think it was Brittany Droli um, shared the article about his story, um, and it's just he just has an incredible story, even going back to his time with the Royals, with his son and kind of taking care of his son, um, and I think kind of. Pitching while your son is going through all this is a sign of being a coconut. Yep, um, I'll give you that. That's that's hard to focus on pitching when you have a sick kid. And then the other guy that made me think of it too, and I don't know his story at all, but the interview that speaking of coconuts that Tyler Wells gave last night after he pitched, or two nights ago, I don't even remember. I think it was two two nights ago now. Um, it was two nights ago where he, he talked about his. Mother dying at a young age. Right. And then he's kind of his grandmother became kind of that mother figure. And she died when he was 16. And the question was, the question that prompted it was like, how are you so fearless in the mound? And he said, well, here's what I've been through in life. And this kind of made me kind yeah. of who I am. And well, so that, that's a sign of a coconut of overcoming that adversity of losing your mother and your grandmother at such a young age. Yeah. So I thought those were cool. I mean, I'm just, you get to know these players and they become... Like, Jorge Lopez frustrates me to no end, but you start rooting for guys, right, because of his, his story, and you start rooting for Tyler Wells because of his story. And it doesn't matter that, you know, the team is 30 games under 500 or whatever and 25 back in the AL East. Like, that doesn't matter because you just start to root for these, these players. And I don't care what Bert says, how you just root for jerseys. Ah, you know, you, you also root for, for some of these guys to be successful. And this is, I mean, Watkins, Wells... Um, Lopez are all, by the way, rebuilding team stories. Like, Wells probably doesn't get picked up unless you're rebuilding in the Rule 5 draft. Where Lopez certainly isn't still starting if you're not rebuilding. Um, and Spencer Watkins, right, probably doesn't make his MLB appearance with a team in contention. Right, so you're th- correct. These are great kind of rebuild stories, and uh, I'm huge fans of Watkins and Lopez and Wells, and I, I hope they continue to play well for the Orioles. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, again, we know this team's not good this year. Second half's not going to get any better. So you have to find why you root for these guys. And it becomes little stories like that where I like this guy. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Wells in the closer role now and throwing 97 and then making people look silly with his off-speed yeah. stuff has become, has developed into a really cool story. It reminds me a lot of the Zach Britton story, failed starter, not really working at starter, that that's starting bringing his power to the uh, back of the bullpen, and it seems to be working. Yeah, and I just think about all the. I mean, shoot, I'm going to try to name it. I can't even name him anymore. Nestor Cortez, all our kind of Rule Five picks was T.J. McFarland in there, maybe. All these Rule Five picks. Um, who's that pitcher we got from Boston, who I think is now pitching Japan? Last I saw. Um, but all these Rule 5 guys right, that didn't as pitchers, who, yeah, they, they, like, were embarrassing. Like, you had to save them for when you were down 10 runs right. or up 10 runs. I think Darren O'Day was the only Rule 5 uh, pitcher that worked out well. Yeah, was he Rule 5 with the Orioles? Mm, maybe, was, you're right. Maybe he was Rule 5 before he came to Baltimore. Yeah, I think, I think he might have been. But, that, yeah, that was forever ago. So, um, and so, yeah, I just have this vision of kind of, you just hide them in your bullpen, and they're just so t- – but, but Tyler Wells has turned into arguably your best or one of your right. best bullpen arms. A very cool story. Yeah, because the storyline going into the season was definitely uh, they're just going to take up space. Yeah. So. And you got room for him, so stick him in there. But he, he, he's turned into having a 
a vital role at the, at the bullpen. And Spencer Watkins, like, again, I'm just, I'm fascinated to see how long Spencer Watkins can kind of ride this train of success. Um, now three games started, 16 and a third innings pitched, uh, a whip of 1.16, ERA of 1.65. How long can he keep this thing going? I'm, I'm, I'm excited to watch every start now by Spencer Watkins. Yeah, well, we'll, get to, we'll definitely get to see him again in five days. Yep. So, um, yeah. So tomorrow is John Means. Tuesday yep. is John Means. And that's a nationally televised game, right? Yep, I believe so. Um, John Means, who had a couple re to have starts, two or three re starts. I know most recent, I think three. I think he, I think maybe had one in Aberdeen and Delmarva, and then he had one at Bowie, and then one at Norfolk. All right. All right. If you cannot find the game tomorrow, yes. here's why it is not on Masson on Tuesday night. Okay. It is on YouTube. YouTube.com? <laughs> YouTube.com. That's the only com. way I can watch it. Is I have to go to YouTube.com? According, according to MLB.com, it is on YouTube for TV for Tampa's broadcast and YouTube TV for Baltimore broadcast. It's on the radio and it's on YouTube. Okay. Most people are going to turn into Mass tomorrow and have no idea what's going on. Yeah. And tomorrow is the all-female broadcast. Oh, nice. First baseball game ever. So Sarah Langer, Melanie Newman, and someone else. Yeah. yeah. There's five people. Oh, there's five. It's a five. It's I know Sarah Langer. Person. I love Sarah Langer because she's always on the um, um, Buster Only podcast. And then, of course, uh, we know Melanie Newman here well. Yep. That's cool. So that's weird that it's on YouTube. I don't know how you watch it. You like have it. to have YouTube TV. Can you just watch it on YouTube.com? Can I go to YouTube.com and search it and it'll it pop doesn't, up? It doesn't say... YouTube TV. It says YouTube. So even on the Mass app, it won't be. The sh- the no, you have to. Go, right, I just found it. You got to go to YouTube and search Orioles, Rays, and then it comes up. All right, that's weird. Like, and it's it says live in 19 hours when I pull it up right now. All right. So I guess we can chat in this or, and comment on the YouTube video. Oh, it's really good. weird. Yeah. Like. I don't think that this is not the first time YouTube has done this, right? They've they've televised other games, but I thought when they did it, there was also like a, a TV broadcast, a, broadcast, a TV broadcast, same time. I don't know. And how does it work? Like, it doesn't just show up on the homepage of YouTube. Like, what? That's when I go to YouTube. If I go to YouTube, it's because I know what I'm looking for on YouTube. Sure. There's no like browsing YouTube. Right. I guess I know what I'll be looking for, but like, if I go to YouTube tomorrow and search Orioles at seven o'clock. I guess this will top, pop up at the top, and then it'll be, like, a whole bunch of, like, Oriole highlights yeah. and, like, fan-made videos below it. I don't know. I mean, how many how many people go to the TVs, go to View Guide, go turn on Mass and not be there, then, like, type in Orioles into the guide to see what channel it's on, and there'd be nothing? I don't think people do that, but You maybe. don't see people typing Orioles into, in their, your, into in their, their search? T- in your cable box? Yeah, sure. No, nah, I've never done Where that. Where the game is? Never done that. Okay. I do, I've used the voice remote before. Okay. I do that when I'm at a, someone else's house. Well, I don't know the channels. I'm starting to think tomorrow at 7 o'clock, we, you and I should stream live on YouTube and just call our broadcast the Baltimore Orioles at the Tampa Bay Rays. Ah, uh, so when people search it. So when people search it, they see the Oriole game and they see us right under it. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know how it works, but uh, we'll tune in on YouTube tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. And John Means, I really have no expectations for John Means' first start. Like, first start coming off injury, you want him to capture what he did in the first couple months of the season, um, but, and you want him to stay healthy. But as far as performance, especially the first game back, I just want him to get through, you know, four or five innings, uh, you know, and move on. And not look bad. Not look, I guess. You know, you want him to look middle of the road at least. You yeah, don't want yeah, him, you want to check his velocity, you make don't sure want he's not throwing not, not 91 miles per hour, make sure his velocity is still good. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I can get through four, maybe five. Be good to see. And hopefully with the past couple starts, you know, Matt Harvey, Spencer Watkins, you have some bullpen arms, bullpen pieces you, you can use um, if you can't go, you know, more than four or five. Yeah, that makes sense. Absolutely. So, You got any ball four this week or you want to? Yeah, wanna... you want to do a little ball four? All right, we'll do it quickly. We'll get through this ball four. All right. My, uh, you want me to go first? Sure. All right. Here's my ball four. Sleeping at rest stops. Okay. On the way down here, or up here, 
I'm, I keep saying I go down to the Outer Banks when I clearly drove up to the Outer Banks. I went down. You went up. Yeah. So I decided since I was driving uh, most driving good chunk of it my, by myself, I decided I was going to get a head start on Friday night, and then I would just sleep in a rest stop. Okay, that's good. See, I've never done that before. Uh, right. I've done it like I've done it like 20 years ago with friends. I've never done it all by myself. So, I guess I've slept in a parking lot in college. Right, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like college yeah. age, you do that. Yeah. Not as a as, as a, a grown man. As a 41 year old man, right. I would normally pay for the hotel. You pay for the hotel. You're a working man. You got a job. But I decided to be a little cheap and say I'm just gonna sleep in the car. I got a big car. I'm by myself. Okay. So I got to the parking lot like 2:30 in the morning. I'm smart. I went park on the on the dark side. Whether that's smart or not. It, uh, I was at least I went and parked all by myself. Yeah, that sounds dumb, but okay. So that I could sleep and be out of the lights. I climb into the back of the car. I got my pillow, my blanket, and I, I put in some headphones. I fall asleep. Okay. All right. Uh, hour and a half, two hours later, I wake up. All right, so it's like 4 a.m. or something. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. wake up to all these people talking Spanish. And not like one or two people, like a lot of people. Oh. And I just peek my head up. And I see that my car is surrounded by people. Okay. Like like fifty people, all four sides of my car. Do you like? And they're speaking a different language. Do you yes. like worry that you've under some kind of Twilight Zone area? I like. Where well, like, oh my gosh, did I accidentally drive well, south when I should have been driving north? Well, here's the deal. I lifted my head up and I said, I don't know what's going on. I'm barely awake. I put my headphones back in. I pull my blanket over my head and say, uh, maybe they won't know I'm here. The old ostrich move. Yeah. yeah I'm, head in the I'm, I'm just more luggage Smart. back here in the back of the car. Yep. Windows are a little tinted. I think I can get away with it. And I do. I fall right back to sleep. And then I get woken up to the loudest car horn I've ever heard. Oh, my. And it goes off once. And I shake and jump out of bed or jump out of the back of my car, <laughs> out of my trunk. That's the way to wake up in yeah. the morning. And then I'm like, this is ridiculous. What was that? And then it happens again. And this time the, the horn is held on. And it is so loud that it is like, I, I, I swear that I can feel it. Like like a, mm. like a bass or a subwoofer. I can feel this horn. Even the noise canceling headphones can't, can't no. help you out of this mess. No. No. So I'm like, what is going on? So I go ahead and I peek up. And I turn, and there's people still all around my car. And then I notice that as my head lays against the trunk of the car, about a foot behind me, right at the trunk, is a big charter bus. Mm. Where he pulled in, and what happened is he pulled in, and instead of parking somewhere, he just stopped his car Right up against his bus, right up against my car. So if I wanted to drive away or leave, I couldn't. Right. I was blocked in. Right. And what happened is all the people surrounding my car were on that charter. Uh. And so he came, dropped them all off, and then he was slamming on the horn to tell them all to get time back to in. It's time to go. Uh, which woke me wide awake at like 4:30, I think, at this point. So then I just got back on the road because <laughs> I couldn't. I could not go back to sleep after being woken up by that horn. Yeah, so it was like a 4 a.m. kind of so, break for those, a little rest right, stop. Right, so Back I only got about bus. two hours of sleep in the rest yeah. stop. So this ball one is to mention that I do not recommend sleeping in the rest stop. Speaking of the loud horns, the loudest horn I ever heard was a combination of horns, Bowie Bay Sox, <laughs> truck night. Never get people. <laughs> okay. Don't go to Bowie Bay Sox, truck night. Yeah. I could see that being loud. A bunch of kids all wanting to do the horns of all yeah, the trucks going off. hopping in the trucks, honking on the horns, like a row of, you know, 70 trucks all with the horns on. Oh, Plus can the I? The cars, all yeah. stuff. That's you miserable. just reminded me. I want to throw an honorable mention coconut in, back to the coconut discussion, okay. for Manny Machado and Fernando Tatis. As the uh, Nationals game this week had the gunfire, gunshots outside the gate, and they didn't know what it was. Machado and Tatis uh, waved fans into the dugout for protection. Yeah. So, nice coconut move for Machado for a guy who could have just ran down into his locker room and been fine. Yeah, which I think would be your instinct. But yep. to think of other people in time of crisis is truly a coconut move. All right, so you got a ball, too? Sure. Um, 
my ball two will be, I hinted at this last episode. I'm just going to throw one book out there. Um, my favorite current author is Frederick Bachman. He wrote The Man Called Uva, which everyone should read. He also wrote All Sports Fans. Josh, if you haven't read this, you should read this. Bear Town. Bear Town. You ever heard of that? Bear Town. No, I don't know what this Bear is Town is. This is a book is. you should read. It's about a hockey team in Sweden. Okay. Um, it's a novel. Anyway, he's a Swedish novelist, and I think he's freaking brilliant. His most recent book is called, it's called Anxious People, and it's about a guy who robs a bank, but it turns out, or a person who robs a bank. I don't want to put a gender on him. A person who robs a bank, and it turns to be like a cashless bank, so they have no cash, and so he's just an idiot. And so he's like so flustered, he ends up getting, running and taking people and turning into a hot situation. Mm. Anyway, they're all kind of idiots. <laughs> And it's just funny, but also kind of thoughtful and insightful as Bachman is. You it's can't say, word. I don't want to put a gender on him, and then use the word he ten times. Oh, did I? Well, it turns out to be a female, and it's a bit of a twist. So I just this person. gave a spoiler. Yeah, the person. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Well, it um, it doesn't really It's not a big plot point, but she turns out to be a female. All right. Um, so, yeah, Frederick Bachman, Anxious People. I uh, highly recommend it. But first, go read A Man Called Oove and Bear Town. All right. Those are best books. I started a new book this week as well. Okay. Because of the long drive, and you know the way I read is audiobooks. Yeah. So Andy Ware had a new book. Oh, The Martian. The guy that wrote The Martian. Yeah. So his new book just came out, I think, this week or last week called Hail Mary. Okay. Which I am. Uh, more sci fi? Uh, it's more sci fi. It's another astronaut y book. But this is a scientist or a science teacher who wakes up on a spaceship out of a coma and because he was in a coma for months or whatever years he doesn't have like his brain's kind of mush so he's trying to figure out what he's doing there and as he's doing that memories are coming back to for him to kind of figure out why he's on here and try to figure out what his mission is that he's got to do on this spaceship you were, uh, how far in are you uh, like two thirds you recommend or, it a uh, third yeah that's why I'm bringing it up on ball four all right yeah. Yep. Um, so that's my book. All right. Uh, my 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 next ball. My my ball four. Uh, on Saturday, I stayed up and watched the the you know the Bucks and the Suns. And this is turning out to be guys. If you're not paying attention, because I know it's two kind of unknown teams with a bunch of players you never heard of outside of Giannis and Booker, maybe. But this is turning out to be an awesome. The game Saturday was unbelievable. An awesome series. We have on Tuesday. Game six. So my ball four is if you're not watching the NBA Finals, dude, watch the NBA Finals. I wish they would start a little earlier. The 9 o'clock start is a little bit irritating to me because you don't get over till midnight. Yeah, but it's irritating. Yeah, it's but, really irritating. Yeah, it's really irritating. It's really annoying. But watch the NBA Finals because they're freaking great, and you only get it one more, two more chances to watch it. So that's my ball four, the NBA Finals. All right. Uh, you, your ball four isn't about the big event Friday? What's Friday? Come on, the sporting world. Lights up on Friday. What do we got? Olympics? The Olympics start on Friday. <laughs> All right. But if the Olympics happen, but no one's there to see it, do they really happen, Josh? Yeah, I don't know. That's a, another thing. I did want to ask you a little ball four recap. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I want to hear your ball four recap. What? I want to hear um, updates. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Updates. Oh, yeah. Updates I, on the right, PlayStation fine. situation. You're right. I do have some. I do have an update. I don't think this is ball four. I do have an update. Okay. Um, but I wanted to stick with the ball four because okay, sorry, a ahead. few weeks ago yeah. I made some ball four recommendations. Oh yeah. And it was uh, bottle bash and spike ball. I brought okay. them here to let you try them out. Yes. So do you get behind my recommendations? Bottle bash seems cool. <laughs> spike ball, you don't understand yet. I don't really get. I haven't. I haven't played spike ball. I've seen it played. I haven't played it myself. Like on the beach or anything. We played in the water, or whatever. Um, but so I I don't know I'm I'm I I'm gonna to to be determined with spike ball, but but bottle bash seems like a winner. Yeah, gotcha. Um, all right. So you want an update on the PlayStation situation? Yeah. Last I heard, it was coming that night we talked. Oh yeah, it was coming that night after the podcast. So I assume you got it. Uh yeah, that assumption would make sense. Right, yeah. because he said you would. Of course it would. So why would he say you would get it if you didn't get it? Um, well, I got a picture. I got a picture sent to me of him. 
Okay, we're, that's a step closer. So, um, so he was in a position somehow to take a, or to sell, the brother in law send the picture to him. Yeah, apparently the you. brother in law sent the picture to him. Okay, and so he it's sent not me the it's still not his possessions. No, um, and I got uh, a family emergency that came up. Okay, that caused him to get delayed. Okay, and then um, the then the picture came, and then I got angry at him again some more. And uh, it didn't come. Okay. On Tuesday. Okay. He said it was coming on Wednesday. Okay. Didn't come on Wednesday. Okay. This is getting close to you leaving town. So, so he calls. Then he calls his sister and yells at his sister because the brother-in-law didn't follow through. Yes. So then it. Did, th- did he plug you in for a three-way call while he called the sister? No. Then Thursday, it didn't show up. Okay. And then Friday morning. I text him and I say, I'm leaving for the Outer Banks this afternoon, as you know. I as you know. I said, here's a great picture of my case for my PlayStation. Yeah. Because I want to take my oh, PlayStation. you got the controller, you got the headset. I got the, I, yeah. the sp- empty spot for the PlayStation. I said, and that's what my text said. Notice the big empty hole on the right side of the, of the case. Yeah, and you want this guy to fill your hole. Yeah. He says, if he don't show up, I'm heading down tomorrow, and they're going to have a real bad problem with me. Ooh. Um, he didn't show up. Okay. So Friday morning, I text him, I'm leaving this afternoon. Are you screwing me again? Okay. And he said. How many times have you, were, yeah, how many yeah, times exactly. have you said this? Yeah, all right, fine. So. Uh, Either he is or isn't. Yeah. So then, finally, I say, all right, well, I've decided to play for the, stay for the softball game tonight. I'm not going to leave until 10 o'clock tonight. So you got all the time in the world to get me this PlayStation. Yeah. Uh, I, and I'm here to stay. I am in the Outer Banks and still do not own a PlayStation. Okay. okay. So, uh, yeah, there better be one <laughs> when I get back. Yeah. I'm sure it'll be there. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure, I'm sure. I'm sure it'll be there. I'm sure it'll be there. Um. So, all right. So, yeah, that's my recap. Don't trust your neighbors. All right. Well, we get, we got to talk about maybe in the future some recourse that you can take now that you don't have your PlayStation. Some recourse. I think there are some things that you can do. Yeah, you are. You have some things you can do in this. In this uh, oh, well, give me some position. suggestions. How, how would you handle it at this point? Well, you are in the moral right. I don't, I don't know. Like, maybe we need to watch some more TV shows. Maybe we need to watch The Godfather some more. I don't know if we need to go as far as like a horse's head well, in, his, in, his, in his bed. But. Uh, yeah, I hear you. But it's also a time in my life where I got to keep everything straight and narrow. Right. And this is your neighbor, so like you live next to him. Yeah, I play softball. He knows right where there. you live. <laughs> yeah. You know where he lives. Uh, yes, it's just, it's a, it's, that's just an awkward situation, Josh. <laughs> it is. It really sucks. And it's been months of this. Yeah. And it better be straightened out when I. Uh, when I get back on Saturday, I guess Saturday, Sunday. Or you will send another strongly worded text to him. Exactly. I mean, what else? <laughs> I mean, I've already, I've already yelled at him in person about it. I don't yeah. know what else to do. Yeah. So you yeah. start sabotaging his softball games. Start to throw them on purpose. I, I've told him before I'm not going to show up. Yeah, but yeah. then, but then I realized that I really like playing softball. So that I hurts go. you more than hurts him. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. So I got to figure something out to do. All right. Well, good luck with that. Yeah. All right, boys and girls, thanks for listening. It's another edition of Section 336. You can support us on Patreon. You can write us reviews on iTunes. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Yeah. We even have, like, bonus episodes on Patreon and on the uh, podcast app, Apple Podcast app. Yep. Check those There's out. up there. Uh, yeah, and, and, and follow us for, uh, we'll be coming out with some, some bonus content here. I don't know if that's going to be for Patreon members or for everybody. We'll probably, we'll put the trade stuff, we'll probably put it out for everyone. All right, cool. We'll figure it out. We're pretty happy with our coconuts right now. Yeah, yeah, we're pockets of the people. If, if you're sticking with us when the Orioles are playing this bad, you deserve a little bonus. Absolutely, you do. All right, boys and girls, thanks for listening. You can follow me on Twitter at Section336. You can follow Josh on Twitter. At Josh Rocco. Thanks for listening, boys and girls. And as always, go oh, oh.